Well, we started off this morning with a, a great song. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Because it, it's Trinity Sunday, and you can't discuss Trinity, uh, the Holy Trinity, with, without wrestling with our minds. So we pray that the Lord would, would bless our wrestlings this morning, we pray. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for who you are and the ways in which you have made yourself known and for the great love that you have poured out upon us. We pray that you would, in these moments, enable us to worship you with our minds as we struggle to better understand the majestic mystery, that being who you are. Pray that by your Spirit that you would Help us to see new things and to understand at least a little more fully of who you are and what that means for us. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Countless Christians view the Holy Trinity, as if it were a <laughs> ancient doctrine. It's a doctrine that's best left for seminarians or seasoned theologians who have nothing better to do than to talk about obscure things. The Holy Trinity, could, could we talk about something else, please? Could we talk about anything else? Pretty please? Now, I have no delusions this morning. If you, are, if you have little or no interest in the Trinity, it's unlikely I'm going to make you a convert this morning in that it's doubtful that from this day forward the Trinity talk is going to be part of your daily discussions. And yet I hope that in these moments together that we would be filled with a greater sense of awe and wonder that our God is one in essence and yet three in persons, that he is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God cannot be both one and three, so goes the reasoning. God must be one or the other. Perhaps you've heard that statement, perhaps you've made that statement at some point in your life, but the bigger question for us today is not how can God be both one and three, rather the bigger question is who's to say that God cannot be both one and three. Is truth decided by our ability to comprehend? Is something true if and only if it aligns itself with our own understanding? Is it possible that as Christians we have not wrestled fully enough with this complex issue? Is it possible that we have not taken God at his word, but rather have allowed our reasoning to supplant God's revelation? Over the past six months or so, I have quoted a couple of times from Nabil Qureshi's book, No God But One, Allah or Jesus. And Nabil is a former Muslim and now Christian apologist, and he has such a brilliant mind, I'm envious. <laughs> he is so gifted at walking his hearers and readers step by step through very complex theological things, including the Trinity. And he writes in part in his book, Christian theology differs from other monotheistic religions, not in the number of gods, but in the concept of God's 
personhood. Christian theology differs from other monotheistic religions not in the number of gods, but in the concept of God's personhood. And then he goes on to explain what this means, and he does so by distinguishing the differences between being and person. Being, he argues, is the quality that makes God what he is. Person, on the other hand, is the quality that makes God who he is. Got that? Being is the quality that makes God what he is, and person is the quality that makes God who he is. He is. And then he provides a little clarification by way of an example. He said that if somebody were to ask you, who are you, it's doubtful that you would respond by saying, I'm a human being. That's the what. Rather, when people ask us, who are you, we say, my name is, I am Judy, I am Gary, I am Jeffrey, that's the who. Even if you don't find this line of reasoning convincing, and I would like to say more, but you'll have to read the book yourself, or maybe we have a conversation later on today. Even if we don't find that line of reasoning, the difference between being and person convincing, what are we to make of God's revelation? I mean, isn't he in the best position to help us to know what he is like? And from the very beginning, God has revealed to us that he is one God, and yet there is a distinction within the Godhead. There are three persons. There is unity and plurality. Contrary to what has been suggested throughout the millennia, the doctrine of the Trinity was not created by the New Testament church. It's not a New Testament thing, it's a whole scripture thing. That throughout the pages of scripture, both the Old and New Testament, God has revealed himself as unified, and yet there is a plurality within the unity of God. I mean, think about it, in the very opening chapters of the very first book of the Bible, God reveals the what and the who. As strange as it sounds, we overhear, as it were, a conversation within the Godhead and when they say, let us make man in our image. And the us and the our are not, as people claim, majestic plurals. That grammatical design didn't even exist until long after this. Rather, that in the opening chapters of the opening book of the Bible, God provides us a glimpse into who he is. That he is one God and yet Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, some of you may be thinking to yourselves that that smells and tastes a lot like dust. That you say to yourself, I'm not a seminarian. Well, there's one over there. Uh, I'm not a, a seasoned theologian. I'm just trying to live out my Christian life in a meaningful way. So what, if anything, does the Trinity have to do with me? Well, I place before you today that the better we understand God's nature, the better we understand ourselves. The better we understand God's nature, both the what and the who, the being and the person, the better we understand ourselves in relationship with this triune God and relation and in relationship with one another. So here's the thing, though though a mystery, the, the Holy Trinity actually reveals something telling about God. 
Namely, he's highly relational. And that those interpersonal relationships are founded upon and governed by one of God's chief characteristics. Think about 1 John. Uh, in, in his first letter, John says that God is love. That God is love. And think about that. Love needs an object. Love needs a recipient or recipients. And so from eternity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have loved one another. And if, as the scriptures say, that we are made in God's image, then it shouldn't surprise us that we are created for relationships. And that those relationships, both the vertical relationship and the horizontal relationships, are to be governed by and founded upon love. That we are to love God with all that we are, with all of our mind and with all of our heart and with all of our strength. And we are to love others as we love ourselves. When Adam and Eve's love turned inward, and that is, I think, an apt description of sin. It is self-love. It is love for self at the expense of God and the expense of others. When Adam and Eve's self-love turned inward, it warps God's image in humanity. And that's why we read in those opening chapters of Genesis and all the way through to Revelation what that warped image looks like, the pain and suffering that that brings into our world. And even as we look at our everydays and even as we look at our own lives, we can see that something isn't quite right. But here's the amazing thing, that this God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who is highly personal and who is by nature love, did not idly sit by, but rather he, or should we say they, began to bring into effect that plan that was designed from before the foundations of the earth. That God, more specifically, God's Son, Jesus Christ, became like us. He became one of us. So that by his greatest display of love, in that he took upon himself our self-love, that he bore in his own body our sin and our shame, that he laid down his life for us, that, that Jesus became like us, he became one of us, so that by his greatest display of love, that you and I might be restored to our former glory, that God's image might be recreated in us. And that's the heart of the gospel, isn't it? It's about relationships. It's about love. It's about how God the Father in his love sent his son, Jesus, so as to restore our relationship not only with him but also with each other. It's about how God's love for us is transforming our relationships with others. The Apostle Paul talks about bo or touches upon both aspects, the vertical and the horizontal, in a familiar passage from, from Ephesians chapter 2. And listen to these familiar words. For he himself, speaking of Jesus, for he himself in, is our peace who has made the two groups, those blinded by hatred and those filled with self-love. He has made these two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, 
by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far, far away, and peace to you who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. For through Jesus, all of us have access to the Father by one Spirit. Here again we see Trinitarian language. We see that God is not only united in his essence, but that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are united in their design and in their purpose. Together they are re-establishing relationships. The chief relationship is with them, and then the other relationships are uh, with one another. So what is it? Is the Holy Trinity simply a dusty relic? Best left for seminarians and theologians? Or perchance does the Trinity provide us a glimpse into both the mystery and the majesty of God's what and who? That as we think a little bit more deeply, wrestle with it a little bit more uh, intentionally, we come to the place whereby we see that if we understand God's nature better, his person and his being, his what and the who, that we better understand who we are in relationship to him and with one another that our relationship with him and with one another is founded upon and governed by love, that having received God's love to the nth degree in Christ, we are beginning and continuing to love him in return. And that as we daily experience his matchless love for us, we are growing in our ability to love others as we love ourselves. So that when you and I live in a loving relationship with God and as we live in a loving relationship with one another, we are in some way providing a glimpse into both the mystery and the majesty of God. That he is united in his essence but distinct in his person that he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we confess that at times we've played the role of a scientist or biologist in that we've sought to dissect you that we might better understand who you are. That sometimes in our hubris that we have imagined that we can figure all these things out. Or perhaps we don't even try and we just say, can't be understood, so why should I bother even attempting? But you call us to wrestle. Not that we will ever fully understand who you are because you are God and we are not. But that we would wrestle to better understand the what and the who so that we can better understand who we are in relation to you and to one another. We thank you that you are a personal God. We rejoice in the fact that you are a loving God and that you meet us where we are, but that you do not leave us where we are, but that you have reconciled us to yourself through Jesus' death on the cross and that you are even now in the process of reconciling us to one another, that we might live more fully in love toward you and in servant love to one another. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, by the power of your spirit. Amen.